In 1920s Texas, crime was rampant. They don't call it the Roaring Twenties for nothing. Robbers, bootleggers, car thieves, mobsters, gambling, it was a free-for-all. It was cultural pushback against the rigid social norms of the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Everyone was letting their hair down a little, women were chopping theirs off into boyish bobs, hemlines were up, inhibitions were down. And this brings us to a Texas story that on its surface seems defined by the times in which it occurred, but really wasn't at all. On December 11, 1926, shortly before noon, a robber entered the Farmers National Bank in Buda under the pretenses of being a newspaper reporter. In the bank's lobby, customers and bank employees were interviewed about crop conditions and going prices for what was grown locally. The robber-turned-reporter assiduously recorded their responses in a stenographer's notebook. When sufficient time had passed to gain some trust, the reporter asked to dash off a few lines on the typewriter behind the teller's cage. Access was granted, and then Rebecca Bradley commenced to Robin. She pulled her 32 cal hammerless automatic on the two male tellers and asked if they figured they'd have enough air to breathe if they were locked in the vault for 30 minutes. She said she was robbing the place, but she didn't really want to hurt anyone. The tellers later described her as quite courteous during the robbery. She snatched $1,000 in brand new $5 bills, locked the men in the vault, and hightailed it out of there. On the way back to Austin, she took the back roads and her car bogged down in the mud somewhere south of, like, the Montopolis area. But Becky Bradley didn't look the part of the outlaw bank robber. She was a petite woman of 22 years old, auburn hair, brown eyes, dressed neatly in a scotch plaid dress, a fashionable felt hat, black silk hose, and black satin shoes, so it was easy for her to find help. A milkman named Frank dislodged her car from the mud, and the getaway ride continued. In Austin, she dropped the muddied car off at a garage to be washed, then walked down to the apartment she shared with her mother. Free of the car, she efficiently got rid of the rest of the evidence. In South Austin, she bought a box of chocolates and removed its contents. She removed the magazine from the pistol, leaving one round in the chamber, then mailed the gun along with $910 of her plunder in the candy box to her address at the University of Texas. She sent it registered mail, declaring the value of the package at only 5 bucks. Late in the afternoon, she went to retrieve the clean car, and the Austin police were waiting to arrest her. Seems someone in Buda had recorded her license plate, and that was her undoing. Charges had been filed, and Becky Bradley was on her way to the Hayes County Jail. Her mother was notified of the arrest, and she came immediately. Rebecca Bradley was a true Texas character. Though she dressed in the fashion of the racy time she lived in, she was very out of place in the Roaring Twenties. She didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she didn't go to parties, she didn't wear lipstick, she did not apply rouge. In high school, her classmates in Fort Worth referred to her as Miss Modesty. She was ladylike, and she kept to herself. She was liked by her classmates, but didn't form any close relationships with them. Becky preferred to spend her time reading than pretty much anything else. The press called her the Flapper Bandit because it sold the story, although Rebecca appears to have been, well, the anti-flapper. At the University of Texas, Rebecca Bradley was a history major. She was a master's student at the time of the robbery, and her day job was that of a stenographer for Attorney General and Governor-elect Dan Moody. She also worked as a part-time stenographer for the Texas legislature. Using these skills, Becky paid her way through to college. She was active in the UT chapter of the Present Day Club, a modern ladies' club for college women who wanted to talk seriously about the issues of the day. This suited Rebecca, who was a serious girl. In 1924 and 25, when Becky was vice president of her chapter, among the topics they tackled were immigration problems, prohibition enforcement, and, ironically, the crime wave in America. So what would drive a studious, educated girl with high aspirations, a serious demeanor, and several good jobs to rob a bank? The Texas State Historical Association and a crazy mother. During Rebecca's first year at UT, her mother remained gainfully employed in Fort Worth at an insurance company. But when her mother was fired from that job suddenly, Becky dutifully took her mother in. 
It was impossible, she wrote, to study and work 15 hours a day, go to classes, and entertain a sad and lonely mother as well as keep house. So I neglected first one thing and then another. But the easiest thing for me to neglect was my work for the Texas State Historical Association. Rebecca worked for TSHA for $25 a month under the supervision of historian Dr. Charles Ramsdell. She was tasked with sending out invoices to members for their quarterly dues. When she failed to mail these, Rebecca would just mark a few of them as paid and then deposit what she could from her own paychecks. She worked in the TSHA offices about two hours a day, and most of that time was taken up in the dictation of Ramsdell's personal correspondence. The rest of the work had to be done on her own time. She badly wanted to quit, but her mother viewed it as a prestigious job, and she vigorously encouraged her daughter to stay. So Becky stayed for three years, padding the books and depositing her paychecks in the TSHA bank account to cover the dues she recorded as paid that weren't ever really paid, all the while never catching up on sending those invoices. And then her mother had another brilliant idea. She and her daughter would move out to a camp near Deep Eddy to soothe her nerves and get away from the noise of the campus. Now remember, Deep Eddy in the 1920s housed a privately owned amusement park, so I'm not really sure how that was going to soothe her mother's nerves. And this camp had no hot water and no showers, just the Deep Eddy pool. So not exactly ideal for a young college co-ed. Rebecca showered at the UT campus gym and brought her dirty clothes into town to wash. During the two years she and her mother spent living in the Deep Eddy camp, she began to wonder how her life had gotten so depressing and crappy. And then she resolved to fix it one problem at a time. She quit everything, all her classes, all her jobs, except the Texas State Historical Association. The TSHA had obviously lost members because Becky hadn't been sending out the renewal invoices every quarter. So she proposed to Dr. Ramsdell that they do a big, flashy membership drive. And Ramsdell said the dues they would collect wouldn't be enough to justify the cost of such a campaign. But Becky volunteered to do all the work herself, and so Ramsdell agreed. He even offered her a commission of about 50% on each $3 membership. So using her last 400 bucks, Rebecca hired 40 part-time stenographers to draft and mail letters to former TSHA members and potential new ones. The campaign was a bust. Left outstanding were about $2,000 in invoices against TSHA for costs associated with the stenographers, the paper, the postage, etc. So Rebecca Bradley forged her mother's name to a mortgage on their home in Fort Worth, thinking it might bring about $3,000. But prices were depressed and it only netted her half of that. And besides, the check wasn't made payable to her since the house was in her mother's name. Dr. Ramsdell, who had been away from campus that summer of 1926, he was soon returning. So Becky wrote him a letter, laid everything out, and vowed to pay what was owed. And then, with no credit available to her and no income left, she decided the quickest way to make good on that promise was a robbery. The day before the Buter robbery, lovely Rebecca attempted to rob the very same bank in Round Rock that had cost Sam Bass his life nearly 50 years before. She posed as a Waco reporter named Grace Lofton for a couple days, hanging around the bank and asking questions about crop yields and prices. And after becoming friendly with the bank's employees, she made her move. She wrote a hot check for a dollar's worth of matches and oil and lit a vacant house on fire across the street from the bank. Then she entered the bank, pointed at the smoke billowing from the house, and asked, what's the fire protocol here in Round Rock? Expecting the employees to rush out of the bank allowing her to bag up the cash. But instead, they said, yeah, we just, we just sound the fire alarm. And then they did, and complete robbery fail. Undeterred, Becky hit the Buta Bank the next morning. She again posed as a reporter and this time got away with $1,000, about half of what she needed to get right with the Texas State Historical Association. She spent one night in the Hayes County Jail and gave a full written confession. After some legal wrangling, Rebecca's bail was finally set at $5,000, and you'll never guess who bailed her out. Dr. Charles Ramsdell of UT and the mayor of Austin at 1.30 in the morning. For two hours after she had been bailed out, Rebecca flat refused to leave the jail. I'm where I belong. I'll look out for myself, and I'll get out of this the best way I can, she said. 
but then they turned her mother loose on her. Twice. After two rounds, Rebecca agreed to leave. When she was finally escorted from the cell, her mother was waiting with open arms. Becky had been cool and unrattled after a robbery, an arrest, and spending a night in the clink, but she was not particularly glad to see her mother. She greeted Miss Bradley coolly by tugging on her coat sleeve and saying, let's go talk in there. Inside the sheriff's office, words were exchanged, voices were raised, and then the two women departed, Becky wearing a mischievous smile on her face that would be seen through the ensuing years of trials and press coverage. Now, within an hour of her release, the press announced a young lawyer named Otis Rogers was coming to Rebecca's legal defense from Amarillo. The two had known each other in high school in Fort Worth. Then, Otis Rogers gave a bombshell statement to the press. Rebecca Bradley was his wife. When asked for comment, Becky coolly denied it. She said she wasn't married to Rogers or to anyone, that she'd gone with four or five boys, and she assumed the press would drag all of their names into this circus eventually. Her mother said she certainly knew nothing of any marriage and that her daughter was 100% not married. But when Otis Rogers arrived from Amarillo, Becky cleverly owned up to it. I'm glad to see my husband, she said, as they were reunited in front of a gaggle of newspaper reporters. She didn't even send me a telegram that she was in trouble, her husband told the press. And Becky quipped right back, well, you didn't send me any telegrams like some of my ex-bows did. Darn the ex-bows, Rogers replied. I came instead of sending a telegram. Now, unbeknownst to anyone, Rebecca Bradley had legally been Rebecca Rogers for more than a year when she robbed that Buda bank. They'd been married secretly in Williamson County in October of 1925. The minute Otis completed his law degree, he left for Amarillo to start work. He knew he couldn't support his wife and his mother-in-law until he established himself in a legal practice. Becky stayed behind to finish her master's and take care of her mother. Another wave of headlines was set off by the astonishing news that the co-ed bank robber had a secret husband. Now, the public were naturally smitten with Rebecca. Her ubiquitous smile, her pretty face, the way she palled around and made fun of the male reporters in the courtroom, her utterly composed and unemotional attitude toward the whole thing. Everyone was enthralled with her, and everyone stayed that way for the duration. Rebecca's attorneys, including her husband, argued that she was insane and believed she was doing right in robbing the bank to fix things with TSHA. Even Dr. Ramsdell testified Becky's mental state had deteriorated since she'd begun working for him. But the prosecutor wasn't buying it, declaring insanity, quote, a disease criminals get when they are caught. The robbery trial ended with a hung jury and a mistrial was declared. Next, Rebecca Bradley Rogers was brought up on arson charges for torching the house back in Round Rock. There was a hung jury there also. In 1933, seven years after the robbery, all charges against Rebecca Bradley Rogers were dismissed. Otis, her secret hubby, became a successful defense attorney in Fort Worth, and Rebecca, the flapper bandit, served as his legal secretary. Together, they had three children. When she was in her early 40s, Mrs. Rogers had a surgery to remove a tumor in her breast. The surgery was not successful and the cancer spread to her liver and to her bones. She died at age 45 on August 5, 1950, and Otis saw to it that her obituaries made no mention of her dabbling in robbery. He died a year later of complications from type 2 diabetes that had plagued him much of his adult life. So what is the takeaway here in the story of the so-called flapper bandit? Maybe it's that you shouldn't go live in a commune near Deep Eddy just because mama said so. Maybe it's a cautionary tale about what happens when we procrastinate in our work. Or maybe the lesson here is that if you're going to rob a bank, make sure that you're alluring and mysterious when you do and secretly married to a lawyer. So what are your thoughts on the flapper bandit? Do you think she was truly insane? Or do you think she was an irresponsible college kid who blamed her poor choices on her mother? Do you think it was fair that she never served any time for the robbery she confessed to committing? Let us know down in the comments. And if you want to help us preserve the stories of Texas, head on over to TexasHistoryTrust.org and join us. Until next time, God in Texas, y'all.